Get ready to find the keys to living the life you always wanted to live. Reverend Steve James and his special guest of top spiritual men and women will share powerful keys to living the life that Jesus Christ came to make available. May I introduce to you our next teacher, the keynote teacher for this morning, Bruce Mahone. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. And Steve, you couldn't have uh, set me up for this teaching any better than you did. Uh, that was remarkable, your renewed mind teaching. And uh, as many of you know, and if you, some of you have been following, I've been working a lot on the grace of God. Uh, we had a class on it with my fellowship here in Virginia a few weeks ago. And uh, some of you were able to join in, which was wonderful. Um, and the work on the grace of God is just fascinating to me because, uh, there is so much in Christianity, uh, especially in Christian history. If you go back to the first century and into the middle ages, uh, where they got so into law and rules and regulations. And, uh, some of that was, uh, scrubbed out with the reformation, but much of it still remains in various forms and new things come up all the time that people want to make a law and a regulation about. But I thought uh, after hearing Steve's teaching this morning, it was so clear that two of the major aspects of Christianity are, of course, the new birth. And to obtain the new birth, you have to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and believe God raised him from the dead. And then as Steve pointed out in the book of 1 John, this is his commandment, that we should believe on Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ, and love one another. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Think of all the laws and rules uh, that uh, people in various Christian groups place upon each other, and they make a bunch of rules for their group, and they tend to make rules that are they're very, e very easy for them to follow, but hard for other people to follow. So then they can be all self-righteous and say, look, I follow the rules. I live the commandments. I am righteous. And you're just some nasty sinner because you don't follow my rules. Whereas if what we're supposed to do is believe on the name of Jesus Christ <laughs> and love one another, that's, as Steve said, his commandments are not grievous. Uh, so with that theme in mind that the commandments of God are not grievous and trying to put some priority on what God really wants us to do. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, something that was the first commandment under the 10 commandments and the law of Moses uh, carried through the gospels. Jesus Christ said it was the most important commandment and we still see it in the church epistles. And that is simply to love God. That's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, let's start in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This dovetails so nicely with what Steve taught, because as you know, Jesus Christ said, as we'll see, that first commandment is love God, and the second commandment is love your neighbor. And as Dr. Werwolf said, used to say, love God, love your neighbor, and do as you dang well please. <laughs> I thought that was a great attitude. But of course, even in the way ministry, as time went by, we got more into laws and rules and regulations like which is the history of all Christian groups, if you read history. But at least in its foundation, uh, what he taught us was very simple. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, chapter 6, and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, how many lords? One Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So that's the first and great commandment. Love God with everything you have. And the reason this is so important is, first of all, it's the one thing God wanted the most. He wanted us to love him. See, God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need for us to make him a cup of coffee, bring him a sandwich, help him pay his rent. I mean, people we know often need those things. They want somebody to make them a meal or help them out financially or 
or pray for them because they have a problem. And, and these are all legitimate things. And these are ways that at times it's appropriate for us to help God's people. But God doesn't need any of that. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Try collecting rent from God. <laughs> you can't. Uh, but what he does want is he wants us to love him. He wants to be loved. And uh, so not only are we doing what God wants when we love him, we are benefiting. We've all seen this in life that when anyone loves us, uh, unless it's somebody that's really odd, we're very happy to be loved and to be treated kindly. And then when we turn around and love them in return, we benefit. Because instead of sitting and focusing on our own challenges and problems, which we all have, we're focusing on helping that other person. And it takes our minds off of our problems and it helps the person. And we get satisfaction from seeing how we bless them. And there's probably many other reasons why it's a good idea. But for us to love God, not only makes God happy, but it will do more to help us renew our minds as uh, Steve taught us in the last session. It will do more to help us be focused on trusting God and believing God than almost anything else. There are other, obviously other things that are important like being thankful and walking in love towards other people. And those are all really good things, but just loving God will do so much. Look when Jesus Christ went out in the wilderness to pray early in the morning. Who do you think he was focusing on? What Herod thought? <laughs> I don't think so. I think he was focusing on loving God and praying to God and going to God with his concerns and asking God what to do. And that's where the strength of his ministry was. Was he listened to God? And to do that, he had to love God, look to God, focus on God, listen to God. And, and this is really important because in so much of Christianity and so much in life, we focus on our circumstances and other people. And yes, it's true. We want to focus on other people to the end. We can love them and help them and encourage them and whatever God puts on our heart to do for them. But our real strength in life comes from focusing on God. And then with what God gives us, we can turn around and do more for people. What's it say uh, somewhere in Ephesians, something like we were created unto good works. Uh, God gave us Holy Spirit so that we could then reach out to others. And that's important. But how can we do that unless we're focusing on God? He's the source of all our supply. He's the source of all our wisdom. He's the one that gives us the revelation and puts things on our hearts to go do for people. So as much as we wanna love each other, and encourage each other, which we should do, we first have to look to God. We have to love God. We have to focus on God. We get too distracted, even by people in the fellowship, even by family members, even by people we love. Nothing wrong with that. We should help them and focus on them. But first, we have to focus on loving God. You notice that the first commandment is to love God. The second is to love your neighbor. Because it's only when you focus on God, you'll have your brain in the place and your attitude in the place and looking to your source of supply that then you are able to then love your neighbor. So love the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let's flip the page over. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. When God chose the sons of Abraham and which later on became the sons of Israel, which later on became the 12 tribes, they were a very small group. You know, maybe depending on if you included kids and servants, maybe a few dozen, maybe a few hundred. They, it says you were the fewest of all people. That's not why he chose them. It wasn't like he was looking at the polls or the sales statistics and saying, oh, I'm going for this demographic because they have more money and there's more customers there. Nope. 
You do that in business, you do that in politics, but that's not what God was doing. Verse 8, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would, or he wanted to keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So the reason God delivered his people from Egypt was because he loved them and he wanted to keep his promises. And that's still the reason he does things today. He loves us and he wants to keep his promises. Look at all the great stuff we learned on the renewed mind today. And we know many other promises where God has said, I'll direct your paths, supply your needs, give you the desires of your heart and so many other things. He loves us and he wants to keep his promises. Verse nine, know, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that what? Love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. You have to love God and keep his commandments. Now in the Old Testament, the commandments were a lot. The whole book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy is mostly just commandments. A huge number of commandments to follow. Yet now in the age of grace, commandments are very simple. Uh, Steve read them to us. Believe on the name of Jesus Christ and love one another. So if we love God, believe on the name of Jesus Christ and love one another, God's going to take care of us. Isn't that simple? Let's read that again. Verse 9 of Deuteronomy 7. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And that's important. A thousand generations is a long time. Sometimes we think only Abraham or Moses or David or, you know, Elijah or Paul or Peter or even Jesus Christ, they were the only ones that could operate the power of God and get answers to prayer. But no, God keeps his, co his covenant to a thousand generations, meaning basically forever. Um, Deuteronomy 10. Deuteronomy 10. In verse 12. Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, O Israel, what doth the Lord require of thee but to fear, to reverence the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? So, list a number of things, but right in the middle of it is to love him. Verse 13. To keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heavens of heavens is the Lord thy Lord, thy God, the earth also, with all that therein is. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed, their offspring after them, even you about people, as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. God was always interested in people's hearts. Uh, at our fellowship this past week, I taught on circumcision, and how that was one of the Old Testament laws that they just couldn't give up in the first century church, because there were so many uh, Christians that were from the Judean background who'd been raised with the circumcision as a requirement for their covenant with God, that they just couldn't give it up. They had a very hard time letting go of that. They had a very hard time accepting that you could get born again without first being circumcised. But even in the Old Testament, God's making clear that it's not just a physical circumcision of the male foreskin that's the big deal, but circumcision of your heart. Verse 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Quit being so dang stubborn. You're, you're, you were circumcised as an eight-year-old boy. Good. But now, now that you're an adult, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. In other words, believe God, trust God, love God, walk with God, quit being so stiff-necked and stubborn and refusing to obey God. And notice also in verse 13, it says, to keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command thee this day for what? For thy good. It was to their benefit. And obviously, this is a different administration. They had different commandments, but the concept is still there. You walk with God and do what he says, you'll benefit. 
just like Steve taught us in the last session on the renewed mind. Yes, if you renew your mind, God's happier. The other believers are happier because you can be of more help to them. But you're happier. You're better off because you're focused on God and his love, his deliverance, his victory, his answers to prayer, instead of being focused on all the problems in the world around you. Face it, there's problems with people, there's problems with money, there's problems with health, there's problems with attitude. They're just, we're just surrounded by stuff that's complicated. But you focus on God, and all of a sudden, it gets very simple. Reminds me of, uh, you know, when the disciples were out in the boat and there was a big storm and they woke Jesus Christ up and he calmed the waters. Well, that's what happens in our minds. What's it say in uh, Isaiah 26? Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So if you want to live a peaceful, happy life, it's not that complicated. Focus your mind on God. And think about his deliverance, his love, his victory. I always tell people when they have a problem, uh, and, I've, and I know this because I've seen it myself so many times, when something goes wrong and you get all angry about it and you use bad words and you, quite often you want to you want to figure out who to blame or what did I do wrong or what did somebody do to me but you're not going to get anywhere when you're focusing on all that when sooner or later you put all that aside and say I don't care whose fault it is I don't care if I messed up I don't care if Billy Jean messed up or Herman Fred messed up it makes no difference we have a problem, but I'm going to pray and ask God to help us through this. That's when things start to get better. You focus on looking to God. You focus on loving God and being thankful to him for all he's done for you and praying that it'll help you yet one more time. That's when things start to improve. That's why the renewed mind, as Steve taught us, is so very important. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter, wait, how did I get, how far did I get? In, were we in Deuteronomy 11? Oh, you're in 10. Oh, I'm still in 10. Thank you. Thank you. I thought I might have skipped something. Um, yes, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff necked. Don't worry about just what happened physically when you were eight days old. What's going on in your mind? Deuteronomy 11. Therefore, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his commandments always. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand and his stretched out arm and his miracles and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt and unto all his land. And what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, unto their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord hath destroyed them unto this day, and what he did unto you in the, the wilderness until ye came into this place, and what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the sons of, of Reuben, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their households and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did, Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong and go in and possess the land, whether ye go to possess it. Verse 9. And that ye may prolong your days in the land, which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed, a land that floweth with milk and honey. And the land, verse 10, whither thou goest in to possess it, is not as the land of Egypt, from whence ye came out, where thou sowest thy seeds and waterest to with thy foot, talking about the little valves they use to move water from one drainage canal to another as a garden of herbs. But the land, whither you go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. And the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken, listen diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day to what? To love the Lord your God, number one. And the following thing, if you love him, 
you will want to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. If you do that, that I will give you the rain, verse 14, of your land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed unto yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and, they, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. In verse 18, Therefore ye shall lay up, or put my these my words in your heart. Put these words in your heart. See, it all comes back to the renewed mind, like Steve taught us. You put these words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your head that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking to them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, and what's the first commandment again? To love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him. Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place wherein the soles of your feet shall tread, shall be yours from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, uh, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall be your coast. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. Now, of course, today we don't have all the Old Testament laws to follow. And God has not commanded us to go in and militarily conquer the land. Like I live in Virginia, even though we make fun of people in West Virginia, like people in Maine probably make, I don't know who you make fun of, French Canadians. Everybody makes fun of somebody. <laughs> so even though we make fun, may make fun of West Virginia here, and of course they probably make fun of us, God, we have not been given the commandment to go in and conquer it, you know, and, and take it over and make it part of Virginia again, which it was before the Civil War. No, no, no. We don't have the same requirements, the same goals, the same aspirations, the same vision that they had as a nation in Israel. And we don't have to follow the same laws. But the, but the simple truth is you love God and follow his commandments. Now, we know today our commandment is believe on the name of Jesus Christ and love one another. So we love God, believe on the name of Jesus Christ, love one another. Then we get all these blessings that God's talked about here, but we get them in our administration in our time. Doesn't mean we'll conquer the West Virginians, the Canadians, the Mexicans, or the Spanish. Doesn't mean any of that, but it does mean that God will bless us and give us what we need. So Deuteronomy 30. I have a lot in Deuteronomy about this. For the book about the law, there's a lot about loving God. <laughs> Deuteronomy 30 and verse 15. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And in Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. In that I command thee this day to what? Love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and multiply. For the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Verse 17, but if thine heart turn away so that thou will not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. See, God wanted his people to love him. He didn't want them to go love other gods. Verse 18, if you do that, I denounce unto you this day that you shall utterly perish, and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou goest over the Jordan to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Verse 20, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life. 
and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. And finally, we'll leave Deuteronomy and go to the book of Joshua. Joshua 22, verse 1. Joshua 22 and verse 1. Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh. Those were the tribes that wanted to stay on the east side of the Jordan. And God said, you can stay there, but first you have to cross over the Jordan, help the other tribes of your brethren conquer their land. Then you can go back to your land on the east side of the Jordan. So then Joshua, verse Chapter 22, verse 1. Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half tribe of Manasseh, and said unto them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. You have not left your brother in these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren, as he promised them. Therefore now return you, and get you unto your tents, and unto the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side, Jordan. Now look at verse five. But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you. Now what's the commandment of the law and the law? To love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So you're starting to see a pattern here. The first commandment in the law, love God. And every time they're exhorted, it's love God and then do what he says. But it starts with loving God. And if you love him, you won't mind doing what he says. It's like that with people we know. If they're people we love, we don't mind, you know, listening to what they say and trying to help them with what's important to them because we love them. If we don't give a hoot about what they think, then every little thing they ask us to do is annoying. But if we love them, we'll try very hard to do what they say, because it's what we want to do. Um, First Chronicles. Now we'll take a little detour and look at a, what do they call it in business? A case study? We'll look at an example of what happens. Somebody who's not loving God. First Chronicles chapter 10. This is the end of Saul's life, the first king of Israel. Uh, so first Chronicles chapter 10 and verse one. Now the Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. Verse two, and the Philistines followed hard after Saul and after his sons and the Philistines slew Jonathan, one of Saul's sons and a very dear friend of David, the king, soon to be king. They slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was wounded of the archers. Then said Saul to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. So Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise on the sword and died. So Saul fell on his sword. That's how he died. So Saul died and his three sons and all his house died together. When all the men of Israel that were in the valley saw that they fled and Saul and his sons were dead, then they forsook their cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. Verse eight, and it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. When they had stripped him, they took his head and his armor and sent in the land of Philistines round about to carry tidings unto their idols, and to brag to their gods about how they killed the king of Israel. Verse 10, and they put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. And when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, they arose all the valiant men and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for his transgressions, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. And also 
for asking counsel, one that had a familiar spirit, to inquire of him. And inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. So we saw that Saul actually died by falling on his sword. But from a spiritual point of view, it says here that God slew him. Well, what God really did was because Saul was not loving God and following his commandments, um, as both written in the scriptures and given to him by the prophet Samuel, um, then God couldn't help him because Saul wasn't loving God. He wasn't following his commandments. He was going after, in essence, false gods by asking a woman with a familiar spirit what to do. He's inquiring of devil spirits. And because of that, God couldn't help him. And when God withdrew his support, often called his hand of blessing from his life, God says, he slew him. He didn't physically kill Saul, but when he took away his blessing, that was the equivalent of slaying somebody. You know, it's like, uh, what would you say? We're on an airplane and it's about to crash and I take away your parachute. Well, you die in the crash. I didn't kill you, but I took away the parachute so you couldn't live. <laughs> That's sort of what God did. But it's because Saul cease to continue to love God and follow his commandments. Not a good thing to do. So that's what somebody would call, uh, well, it's a good lesson for us. There are various names. But it, oh, somebody, people use terms like a cautionary tale. <laughs> it's something you read and it helps you use caution the next time. Okay, let's go on to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Here we go. Matthew 22 and verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he, Jesus Christ, had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Two primary groups of Jews in Jerusalem at the time. There were many others, but the two biggies were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And when the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So in the Old Testament, it was the law. In the Christ administration, when Jesus Christ is in the midst of fulfilling the Old Testament law, and he's the one that's getting revelation and giving people sort of the marching orders for that administration, he says the most important thing is first love God, secondly love your neighbor. Everything depends on that. And then Romans 8, verse 28. A few more here to wrap up. Romans 8, in verse 28. Romans 8, in verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that what? Love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. And of course, the context is speaking in tongues. So when you speak in tongues and you're called according to God's purpose, in other words, you're following his commandments, everything will work together for good. So this is the way I recommend living. Believe on the name of Jesus Christ, which we've done by getting born again. Love one another, speak in tongues, and love God. See, I can do that. Sometimes when I think about all the things in Leviticus, I get a little confused. What am I going to do on Thursday? <laughs> but to know that I should love God, speak in tongues, and love my neighbor, love the believers, love anybody I can help, I can live that way. Then we won't end up like Saul. Mm -hmm. Philistines chopping our heads off and putting them in the 
house of Dagon. That's not going to happen because God will bless us and everything we do will prosper. All things work together for good unto them that love God, that are called according to his purpose. The context in Romans 8 is speaking in tongues. Now we'll end with one of the verses Steve had in his notes. I thought, how nice is that? Steve's giving me a little pre preview for what I'm going to read. 1 John chapter 5. There are people who get all nervous and say, oh, Steve read that verse. I can't read it. I got to take it out. No, it was true an hour ago when Steve read it, and it's true now when I read it. <laughs> It'll be true tomorrow morning if you read it, <laughs> or the day after. It's been true for 2,000 years, and it's still true. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 2. Oh, let's go back to verse 1. Get a running start. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, that's God, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Anybody that loves the Father loves the Son. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we do what? Love God and keep his commandments. Because sometimes it's hard to figure out how to walk in love. I mean, there's so many different things you could do for everybody you meet. But when you love God and simply live his word, then you're walking in love towards others. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. And that's a great thing. And that's going to be the theme of the work I'll continue to do on the grace of God. And uh, again, I uh, will be teaching a second class on it this October, which any of you are welcome to join in on if you want. And then hopefully sometime within a year, there will be a book published called Why Grace is Sufficient. And much of the theme of that will end up being that his commandments are not grievous. Um, every group I've ever met ends up with grievous commandments. Like I say, in the way ministry, we started out, love God and love your neighbor. But by the end of it, we had rules about everything. And there was always somebody willing to frown at you because you didn't follow the rules just right. And uh, every Christian group in history has uh, ended up that way. And uh, some of them were very bad in the uh, Middle Ages with things like the Inquisition and the Crusades and different, and the Hundred Years' War and the Thirty Years' War, because there were times throughout uh, the late Middle Ages that it, it, whatever your country was, you all had to have the same religion. So if you had a Protestant king, everybody had to be Protestant. And if you were a Catholic, they would persecute you endlessly and maybe even burn you at the stake. Then that king dies and uh, his cousin becomes king and his cousin's Roman Catholic. And now everybody in the whole kingdom has got to be Roman Catholic. And if you're a Protestant, you're persecuted. There was a great time in uh, Prague, it's now Czechoslovakia, where uh, I think it was, uh, yes, they'd had a Protestant ruler. So the Protestants were well taken care of by the uh, the ruler uh, of the kingdom and had you know various tax benefits and things for being Protestants. And then they had a Catholic king come in and try to take away all their tax breaks and trading benefits. And so some of the uh, Protestant, uh, you know, burgomasters, the leaders of the uh, city were there in the palace and somebody came from the new king and tried to tell them this and they threw him out the window. <laughs> I don't think he killed him. He landed in a in a in a, in a uh, uh, buggy filled with hay, but that's where the term defenestration came from. Fancy word that means to throw somebody out the window. <laughs> I was in Prague once, and the only thing I wanted to see was that window. And I got I got there as the palace was closing, so I didn't get to see it from the inside. But I saw it from the outside. I saw the window they threw that guy out of because I'd been reading about that. But the point is, there are so many laws and rules that Christians put upon themselves and upon each other. And then throughout history, they've killed each other if you didn't follow them. Um, you know, there were uh, times that will, and I'll be teaching on this next week at my fellowship, the whole idea of rituals and the Holy Communion and how, uh, you know, and baptism and last rites before you die, things that if they told you if you didn't do them, you were definitely going to hell. 
And then if you didn't do what the church wanted, they'd uh, excommunicate you, meaning you couldn't go take Holy Communion anymore. And since they believed if you didn't take Holy Communion, you were going to hell, they were in essence saying, you're going to go to hell if you don't behave and do what we want. So Christianity is unfortunately full of examples where Christians put themselves and unders, others under rules and laws. And it sounds very much like Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees, you know, you, you put people under these incredible laws and rules that you yourselves couldn't follow, even if you wanted to. And then that's what's happened. So the idea that grace is sufficient and you don't need bunches of laws and rules to stand approved before God is awesome. And the more you look into it, the graces and rules or the rules and regulations are really so you can stand approved before people. You know, like if we decided you couldn't come to this fellowship without wearing a tuxedo, then we'd all be looking at each other. And those of us that were wearing tuxedos would frown at those that didn't show up in one. But does that have anything to do with the word of God? No, it'd have to do with us making up a rule and then getting all self-righteous about it. And that's just one silly example. Well, there are always examples of that with people. So that's why it's so important to love God. Because if you love God and you're focused on God, you just don't worry as much about what people think. Because, you know, God is your source of sufficiency. God gives you what you need so you can turn around and bless others. And if that's the case, what do I really care what anybody else thinks about me? Sure, it's nice when people like you. But if nobody likes you, God's there. I mean, how many people stood with Jesus Christ as he was being, you know, beaten and taken away to crucifixion? Nobody. They all walked out on him. And then after he was crucified, after he was crucified, the ones that came to his aid to help with his burial were what? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. His own apostles were too scared to do anything for him. And you find that in life. The people you thought were going to help you disappeared, but God brings somebody else in to help you. So the great thing is focus on God and love God and you'll have a great life. Steve, thank you very much for the privilege of teaching these wonderful saints. It's been a joy to be with you all. And if the Lord tarries, we'll spend more time getting into God's word together, whether it's on Zoom or on the telephone or in person or at the gathering together. It'll be great. Love you guys. The episode is complete, so head over to stevejanes.com for show notes. While there, sign up for our newsletter, grab the freebies, and check out all that Reverend Steve Janes has available. Steve has plenty to give, audio and video teachings, articles, blogs, and biblical study books, all there to help you continue to grow in God's grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All keys to help you live the life you've always wanted to live.